Hi, my name is Zheng Shen. I'm from National University of Singapore. Today I'm going to present to you coordinate structure constraint and conjunction agreement. One of the bigger questions that I'm interested in is what kind of role linear order plays in grammar. We all know that hierarchical structure plays a central role in syntax. The role of linear order is much less clear. To understand that, we look at phenomena that play that make reference to linear relations like precedence. Today's case study is conjunction agreement. In particular, I'm going to focus on gender agreement with conjunction in Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian. I'll call it BCS. In BCS, there are three genders. There's masculine, there's neuter, and there's feminine. When a participle agrees with the subject of a conjunction, we have several strategies. Notice here in one, we have conjunction of a neuter conjunct and a feminine conjunct. In the subject verb order, the past participle can show either masculine agreement, which is resolved agreement, or neuter agreement, which is highest conjunct agreement, or feminine agreement, which is the closest conjunct agreement. In verb subject order, the past participle can still show masculine agreement. It can show neuter agreement because the neuter conjunct is both the highest and the closest conjunct. But crucially, it cannot show feminine agreement here with the second conjunct in the VS order because the second conjunct is neither the highest nor the closest conjunct. So for both the SV order and the VS order, BCS really has three strategies on agreement. Either it agrees with the end P, which is the resolved agreement, or it agrees with the highest conjunct. For SV order, it's the first conjunct. For VS order, it's also the first conjunct. Or the closest conjunct. For SV, it's the second conjunct. But for VS, it's still the first conjunct. Notice that in VS order, you cannot agree with the second conjunct because it's not the highest conjunct nor the closest conjunct. There are essentially two kinds of approaches to account for this pattern in BCS. One I'll label as linear approach, the other I'll label as nonlinear approach. As their name suggests, the linear approach will have something to do with linear order. The linear approach was proposed by Barton Wako 2013 for Hindi Urdu and Marushi Chetal 2015, as well as a bunch of other papers by the same group. In this approach, agreement is separated into agree link and agree copy. Agree link establishes a feature dependency and it only happens in narrow syntax. Agree copy, on the other hand, copies the actual feature value from the goal to the target. It can happen in narrow syntax, but it can also post be postponed to PF before or after linearization. Here is a graph of where things can happen. First, we have a green link in narrow syntax. Then, either we have a green copy within narrow syntax, that's the normal agreement, or we postpone the agree copy to PF. In PF, if it's before linearization, it's going to be highest conjunct agreement, it copies the feature from the higher conjunct. If first linearization happens, then we copy the uh, feature, we do agree copy. It will copy from the linearly closest conjunct, and that will give us closest conjunct agreement. Let's see a case of a normal agreement. So here is a case where both conjuncts are feminine. The end P will have feminine feature. The participle will first agree link with the end P and it will just copy the feminine uh, plural feature. Crucially, when we have two conjuncts with mismatching gender, there won't be a straightforward way of inserting the feature to the end P. So we have to do something else. The so linear approach proposes three grammars, i.e. three strategies, when this happens. The first strategy is masculine insertion. Basically, what you do is you insert a default masculine feature to the end P. So a green link will occur between the end P and the participle, and it will just copy the masculine which is inserted on the end P. And that will give us resolved agreement.
In the second grammar, there is no masculine insertion. Instead, we postpone a Greek copy to PF, but before linearization. So first, the Greek link is established between the participle and the end P. Then because there is no feature on the end P, the agree copy will be postponed into the PF, and before linearization, it will go with the highest conjunct here. So it will just copy the feature from the highest conjunct. In this case, it's the feminine plural. Then linearization happens, we have uh, from tree to a string. In the third grammar, again, there is no masculine insertion, but there is still a Greek copy to be postponed. But now it's postponed into the PF. First linearization happens, then we do the agree copy. So we first establish the uh, dependency, then we have linearization. Then after linearization, the participle will copy whatever is on the linearly closest conjunct agreement. In this case, it's the first conjunct. In the linear approach, there is a place for linear order. In a third grammar, the participle will copy the feature from the linearly closest conjunct. Notice that the participle cannot agree with the second conjunct in the VS order because it's not the first conjunct or the highest conjunct or the closest conjunct. There is no grammar in this approach that can generate second conjunct agreement. Now let's look at the nonlinear approach. In this approach, there is no reference to linear order whatsoever. Everything can be accounted for only making reference to hierarchical structure. This approach is proposed by Murphy and Bushkar 2018. There are several assumptions that needs to be laid out. First, the derivation starts with just an end head. The order of merge of the conjuncts upper degree and downward degree are flexible, so all the orders are possible. There are two cycles of derivation. There is the NP internal cycle and there is the subject verb agreement or subject participle agreement. The order of upward and downward degree are the same in both cycles in one derivation. And the last assumption is that the upward movement of the subject is driven purely to feed upward degree. So based on these three operations and their flexible orders, we have these six orders. And it turns out that these six orders can only generate all the grammatical patterns, but none of the ungrammatical patterns. Let's take an example of resolved agreement in SV order. And that's derived from this order merge, preceding upward degree, preceding downward degree. So in cycle one within end P, first you have end, then the first operation is you merge the two conjuncts. Then the end P agree upwards getting the feminine here, then the end P agrees downwards getting the neuter here. The feminine and neuter will be resolved as masculine, and this masculine on the end P will be percolated up to the end P. Then we uh, get into the second cycle where the participle uh, merges with the NP. The participle upward degree first, driving the movement of NP to its specifier position. That will give us the subject verb order. So after it, the subject moved to the specifier of participle P, the feature of masculine on the NP will be copied onto the participle uh, head. Let's look at another case which will be relevant, which is the closest conjunct agreement in the VS word order. So here on the surface, we have the closest conjunct agreement, but we actually in this system don't need to refer to linear order. So the order is agree downward, then merge, then agree upward. In cycle one, you agree downward first, but at this point, no conjuncts have been merged. So you merge the conjuncts. Now you have to agree upward. So and will agree upward, getting the feature from the first conjunct, then it will percolate up to the end P. So when the participle agree downward to probe the end P, it will get the neuter feature, which seems to 
be the feature on the first conjunct, the closest conjunct, but actually it never established a relationship with the first conjunct. It only agree with the end P. That's how the, in this system, the closest conjunct treatment pattern is derived. So in this system, miraculously, all the six orders derives all the available patterns, the empirical available patterns, and the unattested pattern, which is the second conjunct agreement in VS order, is not derivable. So now we have one data set, which is the agreement patterns in conjunction agreement in both BCS and Slovenian, but we have two approaches. Both the linear approach and the nonlinear approach are empirically adequate for the attested uh, patterns. I'll present one argument from CSC violating movement in BCS for the nonlinear approach. According to structure constraint CSC bans the extraction of a conjunct from a conjunction. This is true in many languages. For example, in 13, we can see that in English, you cannot say what did Marco buy at movies because that would be extracting out of a conjunction. But this band does not hold in BCS because we can say something like book is Marco and movies bought, meaning Marco bought books and movies. Here, books, as you can see, did move out of the conjunction phrase. I'll label the movement of the conjunct as CSCV movement or CSCV. It turns out that the agreement pattern on the participle in sentences with CSCV can tease the two approaches to a conjunction agreement apart. So let's look at the predictions from the two approaches. First, the predictions from the linear approach. Remember that we have three grammars from the linear approach. Well, what happens in 16? where the C1 is moved uh, out of the conjunction. Well, the first grammar is not affected because the first grammar says, when we have a feature mismatch, insert a masculine and the participle will gr agree with the masculine. So that predicts that masculine agreement is okay in sentence like third, uh, 16. The second grammar is when the agree copy is postponed in PF, but before linearization. So that's the highest conjunct agreement. In this grammar, participle first establish the agree link with the conjunction, then the agree copy is postponed in the PF. Even though the C1 is moved away, it can still value the participle because there should be a copy there. So agree copy can copy the feature from the lower copy of C1. So it predicts that C1 agreement is still available. Interestingly, grammar 3, what we predict is that C2 agreement should be available as well. Remember that grammar 3 is agree copy is in PF after linearization. Well, after linearization, C1 is moved away. So C2 becomes the closest conjunct to the participle within the conjunction because that's the only conjunct in the conjunction. So it will predict that C2 agreement become available. So the prediction is that C1, C2, and masculine agreement are all available in CSCV movement. Now let's look at the predictions from the nonlinear approach. In the nonlinear approach, agreement and movement of the subject are linked. So when the participle probes up, triggering the movement of the subject to its specified position, either the end P or the first conjunct can move up and agree. And because of this, we can have CSCV movement. And when the first conjunct moves up, that's the only conjunct that can control agreement on the participle because the movement itself is triggered by upward agree as proposed in Murphy and Bushcart 2018. There are three out of six orders that can derive this CSCV word order listed here. So the prediction is that since CSCV movement is triggered by upward agree, when C1 moves, only C1 can control the agreement. 
C2 and masculine agreement are predicted by this approach to be not available in CSCV. Having laid out the predictions for CSCV plus agreement, now we can look at some facts about CSCV. The data to be reported here come from two sets of surveys. Survey 1 is a Google form with 30 participants from the Facebook group, How Would You Say, in BCS. Uh, the second survey is a series of short surveys distributed to uh, seven to eight speakers. The first observation of CSCV is that CSCV is subject to considerable inter-speaker variation. In survey one, seven out of 30 participants gave sentences with CSCV in, uh, in B and C a rating of one, while giving the first sentence, which is without CSCV, a base sentence, a mean rating of 4.4 .4 out of 5. I take this to mean that some speakers, they just don't accept CSCV, even though they're speakers of BCS. The second observation is that CSCV can be scrambling, but it's much less acceptable as a WH movement. Within the remaining 33 participants who gave at least one of the sentence with CSCV a rating above one in survey one, the main rating for CSCV as scrambling is 3.1 out of five, but the uh, CSCV as WH movement is 1.5 uh, out of five. So this is compatible with the existing examples in the literature, all being uh, topicalization or scrambling. So we'll focus on scrambling for the rest of the talk. Now we're ready to look at the actual interaction between CSEV and conjunction agreement. 25 are baseline uh, VS sentences with no CSEV. As you can see here, the first conjunct or the highest conjunct agreement is uh, almost four out of five. The resolved agreement is four out of five, but the second conjunct agreement, which is reported to be bad, is only 2.1 out of 5. This confirms the uh, reported uh, judgment in the literature. Now let's look at sentences with CSCV. As you can see, the first conjunct or the closest conjunct, which is agreeing with C1, remains to be acceptable, which is 3.1. Whereas the resolved agreement is 1.6 out of 5, and the C2 agreement is 1.5 out of 5. Just like predicted by the nonlinear approach, when the first conjunct is moved, the resolved agreement and C2 agreement are not available. Only the C1 agreement is available. This result is also confirmed in survey two with seven native speakers on a seven point scale. Here again, it's these are baseline sentences where this is the C1 agreement, very high, resolved agreement, still acceptable, C2 agreement, bad. And in a sentence with CSCV movement, C1 stays acceptable, resolved agreement is not acceptable, and C2 remains not acceptable. So this fact supports the nonlinear approach because the nonlinear approach predicts that only C1 agreement is available, and it does not support the linear approach, which predicts all three strategies to be available. Now I want to address some alternative explanations for the pattern and why I don't think they work. First, what if closest conjunct agreement plus CSCV is derived from clausal ellipsis? So here is what the analysis would be. What we're conjoining is not actually two NPs, but two clauses. So we have sabers yesterday collided and spears yesterday collided. But what we do is we delete everything in the second clause except for the subject. Now we have the same string as sabers are yes, they collided and spears, but without the actual CSCV. This ellipsis analysis can account for the absence of resolved agreement because there was no uh, conjunction to be resolved or and the absence of C2 agreement because C2 and the participle are never in the same clause. Whereas C1 agreement is natural because that's the only subject 
in the same class with the participle. I report three tests in 31 to show that the ellipsis analysis is not on the right track. Sentences in 31 were presented with figure one to three and the participant will ask if the sentences are described, can describe the pictures truthfully. The scenarios that are depicted by these three figures, I would argue are readings that cannot be generated by the ellipsis analysis. 31a, sabers and spears were put in three boxes today. The figure one shows that spears were put in two boxes where sabers were put in one box. So together they were put in three boxes. This is the cumulative reading of three boxes, which cannot be generated by sabers were put in three boxes and spears were put in three boxes. 31b is a diagnostics I took from Asanievich et al. 2020, the syntax paper, and figure two was their figure two in this paper. Uh, this is the collective reading of predicates like collided. Sabers and spears collided in battle yesterday. And in this figure two, which is the figure two in Asanievich et al. 2020, you can see that it's one saber and one spear colliding, another saber and another spear colliding. It's not the case that sabers were colliding with the, in themselves or spears were colliding within themselves. So again, this cannot be truthfully generated if this were ellipsis. 31C is the uh, relative reading with, sorry, internal reading with relative uh, actives like different. So here, as you can see in the picture, in the figure, spears were put in one box and sabers were put in another boxes, uh, another box. And the sentence is sabers and spears were put in different boxes. Here, notice it's not the case that sabers were put in different boxes and spears were put in different boxes, which is the reading that ellipsis analysis would generate. The reading in the picture, on the other hand, cannot be generated by the ellipsis analysis. So out of the 16 participants who gave CCA and CSCV a rating above one, 14 chose yes for 31A and 31B, and 12 chose yes for 31C, which means that the majority of the participant can accept these three readings with CCA plus CSCV, which indicates that ellipsis cannot be the story behind CSC, uh, CCA plus CSCV. The second alternative analysis for CSCV is that it's a PF movement. So notice that if CSCV occurs in the PF and follows a Greek copy, the absence of C2 agreement is not an evidence against the linear approach because we start with 32 where the CSCV movement hasn't happened. At this point after linearization, participle will copy the closest conjunct, the feature, then the C1 moves away. Right? Of course, C2 cannot agree with participle because at the point of agree copy, C2 is not the closest conjunct. C2 is only the closest conjunct within the conjunction to participle after the movement. However, CSCV is unlikely to be a PF movement because it can feed bind variable reading. So in 34a, it's his soldier love every general and self country where every general does not see command his soldiers. In 34, every general is under one CSCV to a higher position where it does see command his soldiers. If this movement is in the PF, it should not affect the interpretation of the sentence. 34a and 34b should have the same interpretation. These two sentences were presented with these questions and answers. Whose soldiers are they? Option A is the general soldiers. That would be the bind variable reading. Option B, someone else, would not be the bound variable reading. Out of the 16 participants, one 
chose the generals for the sentence with no CSCV, indicating the bound variable reading was not available. But 14 out of the 16 participants chose the generals for the sentence with CSCV. This indicates that moving every generals in a CSCV manner did change the interpretation. That argues against the PF movement analysis for CSCV. In conclusion, data from CSCV empirically supports the nonlinear approach, making it more empirically adequate. And we already seen some evidence for this uh, rule ordering uh, approach from uh, the Greek first conjunct clitic doubling. But to be fair, the nonlinear approach is not perfect. It has a hard time accounting for closest conjunct agreement in rhino grazing, while the linear approach can be extended to these cases very straightforwardly. You can see the cases here. So where are we now? It's possible that the closest conjunct agreement with NP and closest conjunct agreement with Reynold raising should not be analyzed in the same way. Maybe we don't have a uniform way to generate these uh, agreement patterns across constructions and languages. An obvious way to derive, divide the pie is the nonlinear approach for CCA with NP and linear approach for CCA in Reynolds grazing. Clearly, there is a lot of work to be done. Thank you.